Prayers that move mountains. Welcome to church as we study in the New Testament scriptures what Jesus taught about us having power in prayer and in the sense of like getting the results that we so desire. There's plenty of times in scriptures, which is straight out the gate as our first point, Jesus taught on many occasions that our faith can move mountains. That if we just simply had enough faith, what we prayed for would come to pass. So today I want to teach you on that and how to obtain these prayers that can move mountains. And so that we can also understand how to receive from God. We also need to really expect to receive from God. We're taught to expect things from God when we pray. We're taught to pray uh, with assurance, knowing that what we pray for is going to be heard from on high and answered. And so with that, how come our prayer lives don't always yield these results that I'm just now bringing to you? And all I'm bringing to you is what Jesus said about prayer. He told us many times to pray expecting, pray with assurance, pray with faith that it is going to be done. And ultimately, this is what we aim to teach today is there's some parameters around that that I hope to help you to know so that we can align ourselves with the ministry and teachings of Jesus Christ so that we can be powerful Christians in today's generation. The Lord needs us to be strong. The Lord needs us to be able to, to, be able to receive so that we can give. Uh, I believe that we are supposed to be a revolving door of blessing, which Christians have always been. It is well known that, uh, that the magnitude of effects that uh, churches do and Christian groups of Christians do on a particular community outweighs even the individuals giving to that church. Meaning, the effect that we have of the ministry, once we have kind of compiled all of our time, talent, and treasure, and done not even just inside the church, but what it, the effect on the community and the economy is about tenfold in its, in its increase. You know, that we need to have a greater impact, but we already are having a really big impact. And so with that, let us be thankful that God has already given us a lot. In fact, we live in the most luxurious uh, generation that has ever existed in all of humanity. That in this locale, if we, you live in the West and you're of uh, even lower middle class, we live more luxurious than every king of old. It's really remarkable the times that we live in. So we thank God for the things that we have, but we ask, how can we make these blessings count? This is why we advocate for things like missionary work to go help alleviate the poor elsewhere. This is why we talk about bringing refugees to our shores where we can help, and they can help us too, because it's well known that immigrants uh, and refugees, when they come to our country, end up contributing more than what they end up taking. And so with that, that's how we welcome them. Realize that's a Christian principle to welcome the alien, the one who is not necessarily from here. Although we all are from the dirt of the earth to which God created through Adam. So this is why the image of God, we want to go around the world to alleviate stress and poverty. But again, with that, there can still be even more. Is, is the greatness that is in our country uh, the limits of what God can give? Absolutely not. Heaven is full of good stuff that's described as, most importantly, God's presence. It's most important that we are with God uh, than anything else. But there's no lack of anything there. There's no lack of food. There's no lack of resources. There's no lack of water. I could go, I could go on about what is available to us in heaven. So if God is the source of all things that are good, search up that scripture, every good and gift comes down from above, whether they're temporal and physical or spiritual like his presence. Then we have to realize that God is the author of all things that are good. So if God is the author of all things that are good, it only stands to reason that he would wish to continue to increase the good that is on the earth. And so we need to be responsible Christians to be able to handle that blessing. Uh, a name in the Old Testament for God being generous is Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord provides. God does provide for us. So when we look at things of, I think of church ministry that we could expand based upon if we had more resources, uh, we can do more ministry. And uh, I see a direct correlation to that. And so with that, we pray that God would bring us a greater team so that we can continue to grow and reach the people of the city. So we need to realize that God has called us to pray, to receive, to pray for things, not just his presence, although that needs to be first. Remember, all this is, is marked on Matthew chapter 6, where Jesus says, Don't worry about what to eat, what to drink, or what to wear, for the pagans run after these things. Your Father in heaven knows you need them, but first seek the kingdom and his righteousness, and the rest of this will be given to you. So let's make sure that we keep God's kingdom first, and then we realize that, you know what? God's kingdom needs to be well-resourced, and we pray that it will. And so with that, that first point being Jesus on numerous occasions, and I'm going to get you to look that up. So here's some homework today is I want you to just find some simple Bible references. Uh, you can do that through Google or one of my favorite online concordances is BibleGateway.com. Uh, you can just go in the search menu there and you can put in there, um, you know, faith that moves mountains or, you know, faith that moves mulberry bushes or, um, you know, pray expectantly. Put in some catch words like that and all the verses will come up 
with that and to help you get a bigger picture of what God wants. He wants you to pray. He wants you to ask him of things. And he wants you to rejoice when you have received. And we also need to learn uh, a bit of the caveat like we did in Mark chapter 6, or sorry, Matthew chapter 6, about keeping the kingdom first. In James chapter 1, it also talks about prayer, saying you do not have because you do not ask. But So that implies that we, you might have actually less in your life simply because you're not asking. And, but then also we got to make sure uh, to listen to the next part of that, which says, but when you do pray, you ask for things that you may just spend on yourself. You know, the reason why God likes to bless people is because blessed people bless people. And, and if God's going to be generous with somebody, God is going to be the most generous with generous people. So this is why we want to have some Christian character along with the blessings that we're praying for is that we don't want just to have things for our own good, but for the good of others and the good of the kingdom. So I want to encourage you that that motive is always going to be a part of this, but God still nonetheless wants you to have more tomorrow than you do today, whether that be faith, whether that be uh, salvation in your family, whether that be uh, the needs that you, physical needs that you have, God wants you to increase in influence and in stature. Why? Because that also shows the glory of God in your life, that when you are blessed, that people will then become attracted to you, where then, and the, with the ultimate purpose, when someone says, what is different about you? You are so blessed. What's going on? And then you can say, the Lord has done this for me, and I encourage you to make peace with him and also enjoy his Holy Spirit as well. For it is the Holy Spirit who is the activator of all of these miracles. So we cannot be acting in void. We, we ask in the name of the Son, but we receive in the name of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit is the one who does this miraculous in our midst. See, we're also taught this too uh, throughout the New Testament, is that of the things God wants us to do, He needs to give resources, including the resource that is the Holy Spirit. We understand that the Holy Spirit gives uh, spiritual gifts, but the Holy Spirit will actually give physical gifts too, because guess what? We separate the spirit and the soul way too much, in my opinion, in this world, that our soul and our bodies are interconnected. It's, it's hard to pray when your body's in pain. You know, it's hard to, to go do ministry if your foot's broken. You know, so there's things that we need to have and it's hard to, to reach thousands without technology like this. And now we can, so praise the Lord. And so with that, we, we realize that the Holy Spirit is at work in providing everything that the church may need, including the church members who might be hurting. That's us. So let us pray expecting the Holy Spirit to do good things in our midst according to his will. Now, the next point I'm going to briefly uh, go before I do the Matthew 17 verse of Jesus, his disciples at the transfiguration. Uh, but also I want to, uh, want to uh, highlight, uh, you know, this point again after. So what it is in the beginning is uh, after Jesus comes down from the Mount of Transfiguration, uh, he had left some of his disciples there, but there was a man there who had a son who was demon possessed. But the disciples couldn't get rid of it. And so then Jesus comes down and he rebukes them for their lack of faith. And this is not an isolated incident. Homework item number two, put in there of where Jesus said, oh, woe you of little faith. He constantly complained about his very own disciples not having anywhere near enough faith. So why don't we read Matthew chapter 17, verses 14 to 21, and then we'll go from there. When they came to the crowd, a man approached Jesus and he knelt before him. Lord, have mercy on my son, he said. He has seizures and is suffering greatly, and he often falls into the fire and into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. Oh, unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied. How long shall I stay with you? How long should I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of the boy, and he was healed from that moment. Then the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked, Why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, because you have so little faith. I tell you the truth that you have faith as small as a mustard seed. You can say to that mountain, move from here and over to there and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. So this is one of many passages where Jesus is frustrated with his disciples. Why is he frustrated? Because Jesus constantly demonstrated faith. He constantly demonstrated character. He, commonly, he, he constantly demonstrated everything. It's like, if I'm proving something to you and you still disbelieve, that's like really annoying. You know what that's like when you've constantly proven yourself to somebody else in a matter of trust on the earth. And then they say, well, I still don't know if you can do it. Um, you get really frustrated with them. So in this, Jesus is actually exasperated and he's speaking plainly. And, and this is, there's no, no parable here. There's no nothing. He's like, guys, he gives the analogy of a mustard seed, but it's a real direct prayer of saying, come on, guys, how long am I even going to put up with you? Like, this is a frustrated God. 
He's like, I've demonstrated, I've taught you. I've, I don't know if you ever tried to teach somebody and you get frustrated because they're not picking up what you're laying down. Uh, well, we're in good company then because Jesus dealt with that too. Uh, so, so he's saying like, come on guys, like I, how long am I gonna have to put up with you guys? I, like he was really frustrated that they weren't getting it. He's probably even wondering in his own prayer time, like God, is, Father, is this actually gonna work? Are these guys are gonna be the ones that take the gospel out? Uh, I don't know about that one. And, uh, and so he lays it down to them and says like, look guys, if you have even like just a little bit of faith, like just as much as a mustard seed, come on, you can just move mountains. Nothing will be impossible for you. And the question that was put toward, the statement, which is a question that was put towards the disciples, I've now put towards you, and of course, before I always put it to me, is do we have the faith that can move mountains? Do we believe that nothing is impossible for God? That will be reflected in how we pray. Sometimes we might wonder, well, we don't pray because we don't think God's actually going to do it. Um, we need to pray until God gives in. We are taught relentlessly in Luke to pray. To pray and never give up. To the point to which we give up is a declaration of how bad we wanted it or didn't want it. If we give up in prayer, then we have just said the status quo is fine. Uh, is the status quo fine? Are all the ones you love and all your friends belonging to the Lord? Um, how's your health? You all right with that? How's the finances of your friends and your church around you? you? You okay with that? I'm not. I don't know why God hasn't answered all my prayers in that too, but I know that I, I can't give up. I know that I can't give up no matter how long things might go. But we pray that God would also give us confirmations along the way too. Because oftentimes God does, we do receive an answer from God in prayer. And sometimes it's, not yet. Sometimes there are blessings that have been delayed in my life that I realized that upon once they came, had they come earlier, they would have had detrimental effects for other people. So yes, that required long suffering on my part, but it ended up happening uh, to be an end of a greater blessing later. So we must be able to relentlessly pray, but also be able to relentlessly wait upon the Lord. There's plenty of scriptures to talk about waiting upon the Lord to answer a prayer. Consider the, the complaints that went out uh, of the Hebrews for 400 years, complaining in slavery in the land of Egypt. And it took 400 years, and then one day God's like, all right, Moses, it's time. So let us keep praying. Let us keep make our complaint to God, ask for the provisions that he has for us, the things that we believe are righteous in this world that go, need to come from our brain into our prayers and up to heaven, and then him bringing them back to earth. So if you can envision it, I want you to be able to pray it. If it's righteous, pray it in. If it's unrighteous, pray that God helps us with our mind and our prayer requests. And because that leads us into my next point is there are prayers in the Bible that uh, God does not hear. You know, we learn in James that the, the prayer of the righteous man availeth much. We also learn in Psalm 66 that David says, if I treasured iniquity in my heart, uh, you would not hear my prayer. And, uh, and so there's plenty of other instances like that of people that do wicked that God's not going to pay attention to. Isaiah 58 is another example of one when it says, like, you guys pray and fast, but on my holy day, you go do whatever you want and you, you, you use your wicked lips against one another and you, you beat each other with wicked fists. It's like, that's not the fast that I've chosen. The fast that I've chosen is this, that you loose the chains of oppression against the widows and the orphans or whoever else that may be. And I day, that would be a day acceptable to the Lord. Those of you who pray and love on the Lord, that's it. So God says he's not going to hear that other prayer. That's hypocritical. Now, that does not mean he doesn't hear the sinner's prayer. He, does not, he will not listen to the one who is proud in their sin. He will not listen to the one who is practicing sin. Not the one who has sinned and is saying, oh God, have mercy on me, a sinner. So when I say that the prayer of the righteous availeth much, you might have a shrinking feeling over your life, like I have many times in my life of thinking like, oh God, uh, how would you answer to me if I was not righteous uh, in this moment? And the answer is no, he does hear those prayers because it takes a righteous person in order to humble themselves before the Lord and ask for forgiveness yet again. The people God does not hear are not the people with a broken and contrite heart, even though they may have sinned. It is the people who practice sin and are proud of their sin. There is a big difference there. So I want to encourage you that you have the ability to come before the living God day after day, moment after moment, anytime you sin. And that access doesn't diminish because you sinned three minutes ago versus five minutes ago. Sometimes we get this idea that if we have enough time of holiness, all right, all right, I did good this whole week. Maybe now the Lord will hear me a little bit better. Um, no, that's not quite how it works. His forgiveness is ultimate 
And so as we pray and we realize that we've done wrong, the first thing we need to do is come back to the Father and the relationship is restored. See, this is even Jesus demonstrated that by eating with sinners and tax collectors. They're like, you know, by the way, he, he wasn't eating with sinners and tax collectors who were still doing wrong. These people had repented and were following Jesus. But that's what they were labeled as and known as. And the, uh, the Pharisees and the others would look and go, oh, these people, like if they just changed, they just changed. And Jesus is demonstrating, no, 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 no. The second you repent, the second you come in, you have full access and full fellowship with Jesus, the Father, and the Holy Spirit. There's no time constraint needed. They didn't say to the former prostitutes and the tax collectors that swindled people, you know, stay out there and just learn my teaching for the next year, and then we'll consider having you in the fellowship. No, he welcomed them in. So the prayer that God hears is the one of a contrite and humble heart. Even if you haven't sinned in 10 years or whether you sinned five minutes ago, the, the point is the direction of your heart in that. So please, if you are one who is practicing sin, someone who is proud of their sin, that's gonna, that God's not going to hear those prayers and you're going to wonder why you feel all alone. So there are prayers that God has told us that he will not hear. Mark chapter 11, verse 24 is probably one of the more stark examples of that, that we need to pray expecting that, that it has already in fact taken place. And that is the best rendering of it. It's not that it will take place, it's that it, it has taken place. We need to have such an assurance in our faith. And not just of like that we work ourselves up that it needs to get done, that we need to conjure it up. And it's not having an assurance that the miracle will happen per se, but it's the assurance that you are in, aligned with Jesus Christ perfectly, so it can't be any deviation uh, in, in each other's wills. Because this is the important next step, is that what the prayers that God hears and the ones that he answers are those who are aligned to his will and his character. And to those who have the prayer of faith, those who have the prayer of faith also have the proper faith. So we are going to align ourselves with Christ. So that's a very important feature of this is it's not just for the Christian who's half in the world and half in the church that prays for whatever else and is upset they don't get it. Well, God did, I expected it, but God didn't. No, our expectations that are going to be perfectly fulfilled are for those who are fulfilling the faith properly. And I'll get into what does that mean in just a moment to give you some bullet points of how we can go forward and align our lives to make sure that we are living a life of faith so that we can have the prayer of faith. And so talking about aligning with Christ's character and mission, we need to understand that that is more of a uh, in the head thing and in the heart thing than it is in our actions. In fact, oftentimes most people diagnose Christians or people as either sinners or whether they're righteous based upon their actions. But that's a step too far. That's the fruit of what's already going on in somebody's head. You can't sin without misaligning with God. You can't sin without, without having your mind set against God. And this is why you don't need to have, for someone to be repentant, you don't need to have racked up a whole time of, of sins in your life in order to realize that we were a sinner needing to be saved by grace. You know, I came to faith at a young age of 17. I really didn't do a whole lot of bad things, but I often talk in terms that I'm a dirty, rotten sinner. Why? It's because my mind was against Christ. I did not have the mindset of Christ. My mind was about me, 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 and that's what the world taught me. That's what the devil taught me, is it get your own. This is all for you. This is why I get reluctant on saying go to the Bible to get stuff, um, is because the sinful nature really wants the stuff. And, and But so what I keep always saying is, Put first the kingdom, align yourself with God first, not your own desires. And that's it, it's like when the mind is against Christ, then the mind is in rebellion against Christ. So then every time that we sin, we need to praise God that he wrote down what sins are, so that when we do sin, we can realize that, okay, there is now a wicked way in me that needs to be purged out. Holy Spirit, please have your way. Lord, please lead me in your way everlasting and in your righteousness, so that I can be aligned with you and because the Holy Spirit is not going to do something that is unholy. So if we want our prayers to be answered, if we want our prayers to, to move mountains, then we need to be aligned in character and in thought and have the mindset of Christ. Do you think the way that Christ thinks? Ultimately, Christ is the complete picture of what the Christian living should be. He demonstrated, he came to, that's the best part about one of the things he came down to earth to do was to demonstrate what life is like, what is accessible. Uh, you know, not only withstanding that he gave us salvation, but he taught us how to live. And he accessed all his miracles via the power of the Holy Spirit. We learn in Philippians chapter 2 that Jesus, as if it were, you know, hung up his glory in heaven, his power, his majesty, and took on the lowly nature of a servant. So that when Jesus did these things, he did them by the power of the Holy Spirit to demonstrate to us how to get the job done. 
And that's important because you can't do this alone. So not only is God the provider, Jehovah Jireh, he needs to be the provider. You can't do it without his provision. You can't, we, can, we, we can't even come to faith without the Father first enabling us. So how do we expect we could do a Christian ministry without the Holy Spirit? It's often why so many Christians get tired is because we do stuff in our own strength and we get worried about the state of the world and we look at the news and we go, oh Lord, please come, what's going on here? Instead of having the mindset of Christ of going, then the whole world was against him. He's yet praying for them. Though, think about this. Jesus knew the entire world system was against him. And even the ones who weren't against him would end up leaving him and betraying him and not understanding him. There was not one person who understood Christ fully at the moment that he went to the cross. All alone, but yet he still had hope. The joy set out before him. He endured the cross. So stop looking at the circumstances and start looking at the God who is much bigger than all of that. We need to be pray, expecting that there can be peace in this world. Not, not so that people can go continue to live uh, evil lives. Maybe the reason why bad's happening is so that the world can be shaken to realize, uh, you know, people would say, you know what, I've, I've trusted in this world to give me entertainment and pleasure, but yet it is taking it away from me. So that can't be the purpose of life. What could be the purpose of life be? Praise be to God, he allows us to stay in this decrepit creation in order for us to realize that there's something dramatically wrong with the human race and we absolutely need a savior. And uh, that is the number one reason why uh, loving God still allows suffering is because he created the world perfect. We botched it with our free will to use it, set our mindset against Christ to invent, to create sin and evil. And he could have left us there, but he sent his one and only son to die for us, that if we believe in him and trust him for salvation, we will have eternal life. And the promise in Acts chapter 238 is that we'll also have times of refreshing from the Holy Spirit to get us through from now until he returns yet again. But for now, the world needs to see the mess that it had made because it is a beacon, it is an indicator. Not only is the blessings of Christ that go out through the church and through Christians, into the world uh, that are drawing people to him. God is using the negative of the world. He doesn't cause the negative, but he allows the negative to happen to shake the world, to help them to wake up from their spiritual slumber. And this is really important and strangely enough, acts as a gift. He doesn't do it, but he uses it. So when you look at your life uh, crumbling around you, it's a signal to say, don't put your hope in the world because it is going to be utterly obliterated one day by the words of Jesus Christ when he returns. So allow us to be found faithful in our generation. And so how do we live? So this is the final how-to. How do we live this out? How do, we, how, do we, how do we align ourselves with God? And how do we, when we mess up, get back on the horse, as it were? Well, there's first, there's things like Christ uh, that we can't do. So we can't die for somebody else. So his example of uh, salvation on the cross is a gift to all of us. But nonetheless, it does show extreme sacrifice for the mission. So though we will never die for somebody's faith, we may be required by God to lay down our lives so that the gospel could go further than we could should we remain breathing. This is important to realize because over 100 million Christians have died in the last 100 years holding on to their faith. And why? Again, people, unbelievers, do need to see that someone's willing to go to death rather than renounce Christ. That's another witness. It's a powerful witness. It's a terribly bad one but it will ultimately be fixed within one second of heaven when we get there. Because that is our blessed hope, not this world. But we do pray for good things on this world. And we do enjoy going for a car ride. We do, we do enjoy going swimming in a lake. We do enjoy this creation. So it's kind of like this great dichotomy that we have of realizing this world is a sunken ship, but yet it still bestows incredible blessings in our lives where we watch young ones get married and have kids. And we watch uh, those who have had a successful career and they retire and enjoy their family. And, and, it's, and it's really just amazing that there is still a lot of blessings here in the world and we give glory to God for all of them but we still must not we can praise God and thank him for that but we let's not grab too tightly lest we become like Lot's wife so to align ourselves with Jesus is to be one of sacrifice. We need to have sacrifice on our mind to have the mindset of Christ. We need to have his character to have the mindset of Christ. We need to think about what is the most righteous thing we can do in any particular moment. And how can I make sure that when I sin that I remind myself, this is not the mindset of Christ. This is actually rebellion that is still in me against Christ. I'm thankful I'm saved, but there's still some spots of me that Jesus needs to tend to. Uh, the next is, is like, look at his Christian uh, mission. He seeked and sought those that were lost. He just didn't wait for them to come to him. If evangelism is not a big part of who we are, that's in fact the only reason why God hasn't taken us out of here yet. Uh, how cruel would it be if God said, don't do evangelism, but stay there another hundred years? Like, what? Like, why would you make us go through this for no purpose? But if the, if the reason is, the reason can only be evangelism, telling people, not by force, but by uh, a, a heartfelt compulsion, uh, to make peace with the Lord while there's still time.
And that if, uh, it, by the way, it's the only righteous thing we can't do in heaven. Once we're in heaven, the amount of souls there are already saved. So telling somebody about the gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, don't go through this life without ever telling somebody because then you'll go eternity without having told somebody. Let us take today what is the mandate of the church is to take that sacrifice that Jesus gave for us. He said, guys, don't forget what I'm about to do. Proclaim this until the end and I'll be with you. Let us collectively put this out there. And with this, we can simply do that by clicking a share of this. Uh, this is a good thing about today's day and age is we might have an influence only of a handful of people around us, but we often have more people following us on social media that we can share messages like this or some of your other uh, favorite speakers that, that bring uh, the gospel message out there that we can preach together as a church family. And so as we continue on with this, here's some more ways that we can align ourselves with Jesus Christ. Jesus demonstrated service self-sacrificing service. He demonstrated knowledge, so we must be good students of the scripture. He demonstrated prayer personally, privately for others, and publicly, that we must be people of intense prayer. He forgave intensely. We must look deep in our hearts of those who we uh, are still upset with and forgive from our heart. He was obedient even to death on a cross. So obedience, how obedient are we in every area of our life to Christ? Now for us, we need to have confession of sin, but he is the one that can hear it and he can empathize with us. He was humble. He didn't try to get names. He didn't try to get titles. He just did the work that God had set him out to do. So humility is something that we need to align ourselves with God and he will raise us to the positions that we need to be in. We don't need to force it on our own. Uh, he trusted the Father, that even when he had a prayer that was, was um, uh, when we talk about deliverance, that he prayed for deliverance of other people, but one that he trusted the Father even when he did not get his own prayer answered. Remember in the garden, he said, Lord, please let the Father, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, let it be yours. So clearly Jesus didn't want to go through it from a human point of view, but he did want to fulfill his father's plan. So there are going to be times in our life like that where God's going to ask us to do something tough that we really don't want to do. But I need to ask you this, is our obedience going to be there? Are we going to trust the father's plan of our misery is actually going to be better for everybody? Um, and do we realize that deliverance might come in different ways for different people? Next, Jesus fasted. I mean, he's God. He didn't need to fast to have a fast track to talk to God. So he fasted to demonstrate to us as well as uh, to teach us. The teaching that he gave, he was willing to teach anybody who would listen. We need to be able to make sure that we don't teach above our ability, but that we do teach uh, what we do know. And one of them is your testimony for what Christ has done for you. He taught uh, more than service. He taught thanksgiving. He could have just whipped up everything. Even the devil recognized that saying, here, look, if you just whip up this stuff, I'll, I'll do this. Uh, even the people on the, uh, that were um, arguing with him and uh, chastising him at the cross were saying, oh, let him get down from there. Um, you know, Jesus could have done a whole lot of things, but he practiced and he showed us what it was like to be thanksgiving. You think if you could just whip up bread, you wouldn't need to be thankful for it because you did it. <laughs> but Jesus was thankful to the Father and he gave thanks all the time. And ultimately then he also prayed for deliverance, like for example, in the scripture of this demon possessed boy. We need to pray for deliverance. You need to pray for deliverance even with yourself. And so I encourage you with that, is that all of this is a posture of having the mind of Christ it is seeking the kingdom first and all the other things being given to us. And so all these alignments seem to be responsibilities. It's our end, but you know what? They come with greater privileges. So here's the fact is you need to realize that you are a son and daughter of the king. And if he is putting these responsibilities on you of what he expects of you, what he modeled for you to do, then you have as an heir, not a right to tell God what to do, but you have a right as a child to be able to ask Think of it if like the, the, the more comfortable a child is in their own household, the more they're going to ask of their parents, especially if they demonstrate that they have the means to be able to give their kids. We need to really understand that. But the responsibilities need to be matched. We all know as parents that the, when responsibilities are met, privileges are given. This is why Jesus said, if you're faithful with what you have now, you'll be given more. So let's prove faithful what God has put in front of us right now and keep asking him for more and that we'll be ready for the responsibility that comes along with it. I'll give an example out of my own life. As I've mentioned before, I grew up in a business family. It was a construction business, mostly concrete, but we did just about everything. And uh, in my early 20s, so before I switched
switch to go to seminary to come to, to be a pastor. Uh, I was running the cruise because I had been running a jackhammer since I was 12 years old. So I knew the business inside and out. I knew how to do all the, jo- the most of the jobs. And so in my early 20s, uh, I'm leading a bunch of the crews and all the equipment and the scheduling. And, and so with that, my father was free to, and mother were free to go grow the company in other ways. And so one particular Saturday, um, I had taken the privilege. So there's privileges that come along with res- responsibilities that I took some of the heavy equipment and smaller equipment home because I redid my driveway. And, uh, and so with that, I remember dad called me, uh, where's the excavator? So I knew, okay, one, he swung by the office and saw it wasn't there. I said, I've got it, don't worry about it. He goes, what are you doing? Don't worry about it. Well, you know that needs to be on a job on Monday. Yeah, I scheduled it. Don't worry about it. And then he was like, and I kept saying that over and over again. And he was like, ah, uh, he, he was not pushing hard like he would have a couple years earlier, but he's just asking these questions. And I just kept saying, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. And he was like, all right then. So he knew at that point I had lived up to responsibilities enough that I could tell my own father, don't worry about it. Because he knew that that machine would be where it needed to be on Monday morning, full of fuel, Uh, fully uh, greased up and oiled and ready to go. And so we've got to prove, and I don't say that to sound snotty or snobby or I don't know what, but it is a demonstration of what we learn in scripture of Jesus saying, ask of stuff. But he's saying, ask of stuff, but I'm also going to ask you of some responsibilities. So as we align ourselves to Christ and live the responsible Christian life, we will have the privileges that go along with it. And the privileges are absolutely incredible and out of this world. So this is how we access uh, prayer. This is how we go with Christ saying, I'll be full in. I'll be so full in, you don't even need to worry about this jurisdiction. I've been so faithful at this, you can go off somewhere else, like I told my dad to go somewhere else. And uh, so I want to encourage you with that. And, and I did that because not only was I just a manager at the, that point, I was also a son. So I knew what I, what I had as a right, but I also knew what I had as a responsibility. And so do you. I, I, I consider that a great uh, example of faith that I was able to have in my life by having my boss, in a sense, be my dad and, and that dynamic of relationship of authority and privilege and all that to have modeled out in my life. I consider that a great privilege because there's a lot of typecasts that fell over with that and with, with ministry. And so with that, I give that as an example to you to lean in, to pray, don't give up, ask God for stuff, and he doesn't give it to you. Ask him why. And sometimes it's like, you know what? You've been playing a little too much with this sin over here, so I don't think you're going to be quite faithful with this yet. Why? Well, we can mess up pretty bad and ruin lots of people. We know that there are fake Christians that the devil is going to put in the church, but we also know that there's real Christians who have done real wrong things that have hurt many in high positions of authority. So God will be faithful. He will give us what we're asking when we can handle it and if it's righteous and according to his will. So with that, I pray, church, that you pray in. Don't give up. Don't become apathetic. Don't think God's never going to answer your prayer. Let's don't get discouraged by what you see on the news. Let's lean in there and know Christ is coming back, and we're going to take as many people to heaven with him as possible. Thank you for tuning in. God bless. Have a great day. Let's do something together. Life is better in community. So let me encourage you to reach out to us via the Connect card that you'll see in the description at the bottom of this video. That's your opportunity to just say hi. Let us know you're watching. Let us know how we can be praying for you. Or maybe you have some questions about faith, about our church, um, or about life in general. We're here to help you and we're happy to do so. I'd also like to thank those who are faithfully giving. I can't express my thanks enough. We're able to continue ministry in our community and abroad um, so wonderfully because of your faithfulness of giving the Lord's tithes and your offerings. So to go above and beyond his tithes is just incredible. And so for those of you who want to come and visit us, please know that our service is a gift to you. We never ask for anything uh, from our guests. As a Christian, it is my act of worship to give to the Lord. And each one of us Christians uh, believe that. So if you want to come check us out, there's no pressure. Just come on over. Uh, If you did want to give, we have simple ways. Give at regalchurch.com for your e-transfer, no password required. You can drop it in the offering plate on Sundays, or you can drop through the to the office um, through the week. Just pop in, say hello, and uh, let us know who you are, and uh, we'd be happy to chat with you. Uh, We can also set up automatic deposit. We'll just send you the simple form, and you fill it out and send it back, and it's good to go. So thanks for your time, and God bless you. Thank you.